The views expressed, opinions given, and any communication made between the hosts and guests of What Are You Afraid of Horror and Paranormal Show do not necessarily reflect the views or opinions of Para-X Radio, EMC Network, or all services that play this show. The hosts and services are not responsible for the actions of their guests, and the original rights of all intellectual property is retained by the creator, and all work is used with either permission or Creative Commons license. The show is for entertainment purposes only. How you doing? Yes, we are. <laughs> um, a little frazzled. A little frazzled. A little frazzled. Why are you frazzled? Um, well, in two days is the great American holiday of Thanksgiving. Yes, it is. We're yes. coming up on it. We are, and it's just surprising to me. We got to October, took a little break. Yeah. Had the zombie walk thing, mm-hmm. and now we're back with episode sixty-seven, the Turkey Day Horror. <laughs> Kind of like the Amityville horror. Like like the Amityville horror, except for it's not the walls that are bleeding, it's the turkey that's <laughs> the bleeding. The turkey is bleeding. Because I have not cooked it long enough. <laughs> it's, and it's turning undead. It's turning undead. Yeah. That that could be a thing. Mm-hmm. I've heard rumors. Mm-hmm. Um, how are you doing? I'm doing good. I'm doing good, you know. Okay. You know, uh, you know I'm still, we're, we're like three weeks pretty much into November, past mm-hmm. Halloween, so I'm still, I'm still like you know, kind of getting settled into this this new area of the year. Yeah, because uh, Halloween was like it was just such a reality for a while, and then all of a sudden now it's gone. We really lived it up. We lived it up. Yeah, we did. My God, and then Very it got sh- dark early. Yeah. Do you find yourself just being tired all the time? A bit more than I have been. Yeah. I mean, usually in the summer, I'm more awake, you know. It's it's warm, the sun's out longer. Right. But now, it, it's almost 5 o'clock, and it's pretty much dark out. It's, yeah. But there are certain compensations, like football. Yeah, yeah. There's always some good... Th- you yeah. need to have those things to compensate, mm-hmm. like you said. You know, it's, football's great, mm-hmm. you know. And, you know, it, us being near Philadelphia, suburbs of Philly, you know, I'm an Eagles fan. And, I mean, the Eagles played the Cowboys mm-hmm. past Sunday. I and remember. absolutely demolished them. That's all. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> Allison woke up in the first thing. It was 6.30 to 7.30 in the morning. And she went, huh, what's the score? <laughs> and I looked it up. And I told her. And she said, you're lying. <laughs> she didn't believe me that the Eagles had done so well. They did. I mean, after the Phillies got their <gasps> butts handed yeah. to them. And I was at some of those games. Oh, were you? You went to yeah, some of the games? Yeah, my, my in-laws took me. We had a box and stuff. Nice. We went on our own. And the, the compensation was the food and the beer. Otherwise, right. we would have left. Right. Oh, my word. I know. I know. The, the, the Phillies really... I don't I don't know what happened this year. And they just... Yeah. And then once they started giving up, it was all over. No. They no. started showboating. And they started trying to steal bases. They stopped working together as a team. That was it. Once that slide happened. I think that that's... Pretty much par for the course in anything. Mm-hmm. When you when you just get so far behind, you know no matter how much you try, there's really there's only no catching up. Mm-hmm. There's really nothing you can do. So it's almost like why even try in a right. way? You know, I mean, if you you lose so many games, pretty much out. You mm-hmm. know, you ain't you ain't gonna make the World Series. You're not gonna make the playoffs. So what? Can, right. Considering what sport it is, and you can see it. You can see how they just stop trying. And they just yeah, that's up. it. Yeah, they just give up, and that's it. They're off for themselves. Get as much air time as they can. Right. And then they're done. Collect that paycheck and get out. <laughs> yeah, and then the stadium was just empty all the time. I know. The, the I know. seats were so much cheaper. But I mean, if you enjoy a ball game and you don't mind rooting for the other team sometimes. It's crazy that, it's crazy just the juxtaposition of the two. I mean, you got Phillies who were just awful, 
and they got Eagles this year who are just, they're, they're, just on fire. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're just I've never seen them do this well. It's going to be a fun <clears throat> football year, even yeah. for me. And I'm not a big sports fan, but my in laws are, and I kind of follow it. They're nine and one. Mm. They've oh, only lost one game. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. Good year for Philly. <laughs> yeah. But while we are based in Philadelphia, this is what are you afraid of? Horror and paranormal show. We are on all major podcast services. We are on the EMC network, and we are on Parax Radio on Friday nights at nine o'clock. Saying hi to our Parax fans. Hello. Yeah, so Turkey Day is coming. Turkey Day is coming, and, and uh, you can. What are you doing for for Thanksgiving for Turkey Day? Uh, going to family friends. Okay, but I'm cooking a lot. Yes, I told yes. you about the cranberry pound cake. You I made. did. You have a lot going on with <sighs> with cooking. Man, man, that's a good pound cake. It is so rich. I make it one time of year because it's so rich, mm-hmm. and it puts. A lot. I might do a pumpkin pie too. Okay, that's got nice. some, I got some eggnog. I had to buy a second thing of eggnog because right. I bought a thing of eggnog last week mm-hmm. because it was on sale. Right. And I was just going to kind of sip it throughout the next two months. Yeah. My mother-in-law drank most of it. She drank it. <laughs> <laughs> now, so, is this the uh, is this the special, quote-unquote, eggnog or just regular I'll eggnog? do the special, special on the weekends. Okay. Got you it. know, I'll do that on the holidays with a little rum and stuff. Nice. And this uh, is sometimes you like a good regular amount of eggnog. That is, that is good. But speaking of... Thanksgiving. This is our third Thanksgiving, actually. Yes, it is. We have intercepted a strange <laughs> set of phone calls coming from the Butter Turkey Hotline. <laughs> That's right. Yes. And something weird is happening with their turkeys. They're probably going to get in trouble. They're probably going to sue us. But we are going to play that recording for you now. So this Thanksgiving, be careful. This is What Are You Afraid of Part Paranormal Show with the recording from the Butter Turkey Hotline. This is the Butter Turkey Hotline. I am Silas, your Butter Turkey Hotline specialist. How may I assist you with all your butter turkey needs this Thanksgiving? Yeah, I'm calling about some some problems with your turkey. And I must say, I am most dissatisfied with your product. Worst turkey ever. May I have issue with our excellent and fine species of Melagorius Galapubo Solistris? What the hell is that? North American Eastern Turkey? Well, first of all, the, the packaging is a pain to open. I had to use a chainsaw, and, and I cut off my damn finger. We apologize for that. The packaging was designed to prevent harmful bacteria from contaminating our perfect specimens. We even employed a new and all-natural chemical. Our special turkey scientist squad. Special turkey scientist squad. Discovered in Haiti to preserve the freshness of the turkey. Your turkey meat is now good for one year without freezing. It's fine, you blow hole. But, but there's more. But most of the skin was missing from the turkey. And, and that's the best freaking part. I, I, I can't brown it without the skin. Where am I, where am I gonna rub my grandmother's special herbs? Yeah, she also uses them for her foot disease. Her, her, it's a freaking foot skin disease. So I, I guess I can give some to her. But my grandmammy drives me nuts. Also trying to feed me newspaper and call it special oatmeal. Christ, I know it's got fiber, but newspapers are obsolete. She needs to get with the freaking times, my grandmammy. I, I see, sir, but what, what was your complaint? No skin, you dingbat. What the hell? We apologize that you're un- unsatisfied with epidermis on your luscious and, and juicy epidermis. I, I do love good turkey skin. So moist and cool to the touch. Did you know you can use turkey skin to ease muscle tension? There's a good website you can check for other sensual uses of your turkey skin. wwxturkey slash sensual slash me slash convex. It is by no means my website. It might be, but it is not there. What the hell's wrong with you, puppy liquor? Christ, I just want to cook it. Well, are there any problems with your luscious maligaris? It's trying to eat my ass. Thank, thank, thank your pardon? You don't hear me, Humpty Dumpty Lumpty. <laughs> I'm standing on top of my table right now, fighting with the roasting pan and a goddamn turkey baster. I want to stick it in the oven, and your turkey flapped its wings, stuck its neck up, and knocked my ass to the ground. <laughs> and knocked my two paws out, too. My best paws ever. I'll never get those bad. You're saying your turkey has reanimated and is trying to eat you? It ain't Mr. Mittens the Kitten. That turkey doesn't actually have a mouth or a stomach, so it just engulfed it in a hole in its body where I am already filled it with breadcrumbs and cranberries. Mittens the Kittens is still in there. I can hear him howling. You made my cat into stuffing, you punker lunker. My damn cat into stuffing. He's gonna throw it off the bacon time by an hour, probably, with that cat meat in there. I've got guests coming at six, and they can't eat no raw mittens, the kittens. They don't even like cat. Hated it the last time I served it to my grandmother. Okay, sorry about- 
about your cat? Mr. Mittens, the kitten! Yes, your cat, Mittens, Mittens the kitten. However, we don't understand why this is happening. In 40 years, we've provided the best American turkey to find good Americans such as yourself to eat while you enjoy your Thanksgiving. And never have we had one come back to life before baking. Sometimes I can have any yams, but that's not really our area. I mean, it's not our fault if yams come back. But you said you had a new preservative. Yes, only freshest ingredients from the Nyland nation of Haiti. You mean voodoo Haiti? Are you using blowfish or zombie toxins to keep your turkeys fresh? Oh God, it's got my arm! Help me, it's got my arm! Well, top secret, but we can assure you it's only natural ingredients. Natural? Natural? Are you telling me you've turned your turkeys into zombie? It's got my damn arm! Christ! If you don't get this thing killed and cooked, my grandmother is going to make me rub spices onto her foot disease. My hand will smell like leather for a month. Do you want that butter turkey? Seriously? Hold on, sir. Let me contact our head chef, and I will get back to you. Please hold. Okay, sir. Our head chef is aware of the problem and apologizes for any inconvenience. He suggests destroying the brain of the zombie turkey for cooking. You don't have a head! You num-dums! What the hell? How do I destroy the brain if it don't have a head? Yes, sir. I understand. Oh, he also says to make sure to cook the cat meat at a temperature of 350 degrees to remove the chance of parasites, and he applauds you of your unique choice for stepping up. Oh, two more turkeys, just go through my window. I think I'm surrounded. Ah, what the hell is on me, turkeys? Oh, got my chainsaw. Yeah, I was just using it to cut the package. Ah, ah. Sir, sir, it's a problem. Yeah, no thanks to you, you fucks what you Happy Thanksgiving, my fur red bum. Is, is there anything else I can help you with today? Yeah, uh, oh, hell, oh, bleed it out here, but... But do you think the coriander and the gravy will change the taste of the flesh of the zombie turkey? No, sir. It should enhance the flavor of your zombie turkey. Make sure to cook the neck and gizzard thoroughly before adding them to oh, the gravy. Oh, the gizzard and the organs. I forgot about that. They're alive. Get them off me. They're trying to get into my... <coughs> sir, sir. Well, another satisfied customer. A butter turkey. Oh, the phone's ringing again. This is the Butterball Turkey Hotline. This is Silas, your Butterball Turkey Hotline Specialist. How may I assist you with all your Butter Turkey Hotline needs this Thanksgiving? Hiya. Um, my turkey is doing something weird. It's twitching a lot. I think it's coming alive. And on the last Thanksgiving, the American people learned the true horror and terror of the holiday. Zombie turkeys rose from the pan in households across the country, attacked their chefs, and devoured both human and kitten alike, rampaging across the country. Finally, the tide was turned after several nuclear weapons were deployed in major cities and a special gravy was created by scientists at the CDC to make the turkey meat especially tasty, driving the starving masses to destroy and cook the mess of undead turkeys. And this is the story of the rise of the zombie turkeys. Moral, don't use Haitian zombie juice on your bird. You're listening to the Electronic Media Collective Podcast Network. Yeah, it's a mouthful. For more great shows, visit electronicmediacollective.com. Mercy, a new horror medical thriller from author T. Fox Dunham, published by Bloodbound Books. Based on the author's horrific battle with a rare form of lymphoma that involved intense chemotherapy and radiation, Fox turns the horror of his experience into terror on the page. William Sane is dying of cancer. On most days, death seems like a humane alternative to the treatment. Stricken with fever, William is rushed to mercy, notorious as a place to send the sickest of the poor and uninsured to be forgotten, and finds the hospital in even worse condition than his previous visit. Willie's memories faded. He grabbed his sack head, the sack head of the scarecrow, picking at the exposed chicken wire to hold them in. However, the memories fell out of the holes in his face. They wormed and crawled from the leather flesh and the old clothing of the scarecrow, then squirmed and wiggled down his body. The grounds are unkempt, the foundation is cracking, and like the wild mushrooms sprouting from the fissures of decay around it, 
Something is growing inside the hospital. Something dark. Fangoria gives Mercy 3.5 out of 4 skulls. Dunham has channeled his many brushes with the other side into the exquisitely rendered lyrical supernatural hospital thriller Mercy. It's feeding on the sickness and sustaining itself on the staff, changing them. And now, it wants Willie. Come now, Mr. Saint. Just a little more of that sweet mayo. Mm-mm-mm. So salty and so good. You won't miss it. And we ever do so like our delicacies here at Mercy Hospital. Part medical horror, part supernatural suspense. Mercy is a hard-hitting fever dream of a novel. I enjoyed the hell out of it. Tim Wagner, author of The Way of All Flesh and Eat the Night. Available from Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and bookstores everywhere in both print and digital versions. Life is an addiction. Let go. Let it all burn. Are you haunted by shadow people in the middle of the night? Do you secretly love all things creepy and spooky, enjoying ghost stories and horror fiction from the best storytellers? Do you have a true ghost experience you want to share, but no one will believe you? If yes, listen to The Professionals on What Are You Afraid of? Horror Paranormal Show, Friday nights at 9pm on ParaX Radio and at www.whatareyouafraidofpodcast.com. What are you afraid of, what what are you afraid afraid of on ParaX? Our creepy and demented hosts are on call to provide you with all your spooky needs with true ghost stories, interviews, indie music, and new horror fiction. We are ready 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 to to scare scare you. you. Para X. This is Katrina Weidman of Destination America's Paranormal Lockdown, and you're listening to What Are You Afraid Of? Horror and Paranormal Show. So, <laughs> that's, we actually, nice. we, yeah, we intercepted that's that. Funny. Yeah, I mean, don't don't ask us how because yeah, uh, no. we're not allowed to tell you. No. But we did. Yeah, we did. That, that's funny though. It's trying to eat my ass. The, trying, the guy says that, that was his complaint to the, yeah, the butter to turkey hotline. No relation to the butterball hotline, which actually exists. <laughs> but yeah, no, uh, zombie turkeys are a problem this time of year. I, I know it's, it's something you have to be careful of. Because they do come back and they do try to eat you. And I mean, the thing was eating is mittens to kitten. You know what the thing is? They're getting angrier. Yeah. Every, every year that goes by, the turkeys are, are rising up. They are. You know, we don't have any clown news. We have turkey news. Mm-hmm. Play that jingle. Turkey news. <laughs> yeah, that, that's kind of the, the converted... Clown <laughs> news, turkey news. Instead of the clown, it's a turkey. Exactly. God, we love sound effects on this show. <laughs> you know that's what we do. That's that's how we we get our kicks and our jolly sound effects. We love sound effects. Yes. I love sound effects. You love sound effects. I do. I know. Who sound doesn't effects. love sound effects? Uh, right. Sound effects and rum. That's, right. that's our yeah. thing. So so you see this, Phil? San Francisco Bay Area. Mm-hmm. They um. It looks like they've introduced turkeys into the state for hunting. Yeah. You know they'll thrive in urban areas where they have no natural predators. Right. What kills a turkey? We have no bobcats. A pilgrim with a musket. Yeah, with a musket. And that's it. And that's it. Basically, we have no bobcats. We have nothing to eat these things. They're huge birds. So they basically taken over this, this area, this Contra Costa County. These are 20-pound birds. <laughs> 20-pound turkeys. Right. That's right. a pretty. That's a pretty big bird. <laughs> right. It, that is a yeah. Let me and let me tell you something. I used to work at Pensbury Manor where we we had these wild birds on the site. Well, they're not. They were on the site. It was a a gaggle of turkeys and chickens and things. And they do. They move around in mobs, kind of like the gangs from West Side Story. Oh yeah. And it's kind of like you look over at them, and a turkey will look up at you and be like, "What are you looking at?" <laughs> you got a problem? Yeah, go home and get your shine box. Go home and get your shine box. <laughs> These turkeys are apparently crapping all over Mercedes and, and cars, and you know, yeah, and they're they're, they're knocking they're, they're roof pooping, tiles off. They're pooping everywhere, all over. Destroying know. landscape. <laughs> Can you imagine coming out with your brand new Mercedes and seeing a uh, turkey crap? Well, all over and it? that's how do you explain that to the insurance guy? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I need a new paint job. Why? <clears throat> it's got scratches on it. <laughs> well, from what? Uh, turkeys. turkeys. <laughs> Angry turkeys. Angry turkeys. And the males, the males get very aggressive when they're showing off for the females. The turkey sense is tingling. The, tur- <laughs> the closer it gets to Thanksgiving, they know. They know. They know the axe is coming and they start, they start getting crazy. You know? Right. Right. Um, and, and you, you let you uh, compared um, the turkeys, the gaggle of turkeys, to West Side Story. West Side Story. Are they, are they snapping their claws yeah, they're, too they're, when they're <laughs> when they were when they're 
when they're all together like that, moving from place when to place. When you're a bird, you're a bird all the way <laughs> from your... No, I can't. <laughs> yeah. I, I, no, <laughs> that's just terrible. <laughs> I wish it, I knew his song from it. I would, I would recite it, but I don't know his song. Yeah, I, I just can't put any words from Turkey into the West Side Story. <laughs> and so, but yeah, there are twenty of thirty of them. They're elbow to elbow. They're scratching every inch of land that, that this, these people are saying. And of course, I mean, they eat everything. Right. So they're like a plague. They're destroying the ecosystem there. Mm -hmm. They're eating all the bugs. They're eating the lizards. They're eating all the eggs, all the seeds, all the wildflowers. And you said a quarter of a million. And the only way they're going to get rid of them is that they go out with their muskets. Yeah. Boom. Yeah. Pop them one, you know. Pop right. goes the weasel. Right. <sighs> And people, it, like, it's not something where you can go out, kill the turkey, bring it back in, pull off its feathers, throw it in the oven, and you've got Thanksgiving dinner. No, it's not. Wild turkey is. No. Have you had wild turkey? Wild turkey? Yeah. Uh, no, I don't think I Extraordinarily did. Extraordinarily gamey. Really? Yeah. My uncle always, he said the recipe, because I would go upstate to Pennsylvania, and they would go turkey hunting. Mm. And you would actually right. walk out into the fields, and there they'd be. Really? Walking along, just living in their, of course, they, they were once you know, America's big bird. Yeah. But Ben Franklin wanted to make them the national bird, and I can see why, because they're aggressive pains in the ass. <laughs> <laughs> can you imagine if he had succeeded in making uh, the turkey the national right. bird? Turkeys are badass. That's why we cook millions of them. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, we're the turkeys. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Oh my goodness! <laughs> yeah. So, but that's that's happening right now, and I guess the warning is don't don't blow your ecosystem. Turkeys are part of the Northeast. Don't take them to California. It's too warm. Right. <laughs> they don't know what they're doing there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the, the, and the turkeys are coming. They, they are plague of turkeys. I can hear them now. Yeah. And that was that was I hear gobbles. That was turkey news. Turkey news. <laughs> That was turkey news. That was turkey. That's our thing for Thanksgiving. <laughs> turkey news. <laughs> so, like, do you know? Do you like anything on television? I mean, of course, football. You know, I imagine yeah. you'll be at your aunt's, right, with your family, mm -hmm. watching football. Watching football. You got it. Now, who's playing? This this uh, Thanksgiving. Yeah, I have Thanksgiving. no idea. You have no idea. It's just no. that's what you do. It's, I kind of just follow the Eagles, and then whatever whoever else plays, I just kind of. I just kind of watch it when right I, in the moment, you know, in the moment type of thing. Yeah, I don't know. I, I have friends that will, could tell you the next like eighty games that are playing, you know. But I'm not. I'm not one of them. Yeah, I'm not yeah. one of them. You know. No. <laughs> so okay, uh, but I, I do know one thing. Okay. Uh, at least I'm pretty sure. Uh, I think the Eagles are playing on Christmas Day, though. Are they? Uh, yeah, I, I, I've heard that. I'm pretty sure. I know what we'll be doing here. Yep, yeah, the Eagles game will be on, right? Yeah. yeah. That'll be exciting. Yeah, I'll, I'll keep an eye on that. I'm sure I'll send a little, you know, I mean, Christmas Day, I kind of do Star Wars all day. Are you Star Wars all day? Oh, that's kind of like a, was that TBS? Yeah, TBS does that. Yeah, TBS does yeah. that. Are you excited for the new Star Wars movie? Very, very much so. Yeah? Yeah, I am I'm really looking forward to The Last Jedi. Yeah, me too. I think they're going to cover some new ground with the concept of Jedi. I've heard, I've heard rumors that Luke wants to get rid of the Jedi because... The good and evil just can't keep fighting mm -hmm. over the centuries, so he wants to create a Jedi that's in touch with the dark side and the light side, yeah. which I believe in. Right. I don't believe in absolutes. Yeah. I believe that the Jedi were creating the Sith mm -hmm. by indulging only their light side and trying to block their dark side. And of course, what's going to happen? Yeah. Are you looking forward to it? I'm, last I'm Jedi? very much looking forward to yeah. it. In fact, we, if you want to go see it, we, Let's should, go see we it. should go check it out. Definitely. Uh, December 15th. Mm hmm. Yeah, and actually, believe it or not, I have, I have my Star Wars shirt on. You have a Star Wars shirt on? I do, I have a Star very Wars shirt Very nice. On. It's Rogue One. Yeah. <laughs> so Rogue One's good. It's Rogue One. Rogue One's very good. Yeah, I really like Rogue One. It's, it's kind of neat, I mean... Rogue One or Force Awakens? Which one do you like? Uh, Rogue One. one really? I like Rogue that. One better. You know what? I kind of do, too. Nah, <laughs> so. yeah, it was a really good standalone. Yeah, it was. And it's like, it's kind of nice that Disney is doing a Star Wars film every, every Christmas. Year. Because every year, now man. we get to look forward to it as part of our Christmas I know. Christmas celebrations. Do you prefer it in, in December or how it used to be when it was in May? I like in December. You like in December? I like having to look forward to a Star Wars movie. Because this year we've got The Last Jedi and next year we've got the Han Solo movie. That's right. Solo. Yeah, the yeah and I've, I've been watching Star Wars Rebels, which is an anime feature on mm -hmm. the Disney Channel, like the Disney Animation Channel. Right. It's really good. Yeah. Have really? you seen? Oh, it's really it's it's set in that time before. It's like between Rogue One and the first Star Wars movie, A New Hope. I, I have not seen it. No. It's really quite good. It good. Yeah, they've done a good job with exploring the Star Wars universe. Rebels. Rebels. Star Wars Rebels. It, it's animated, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah computer right. animation, very well done. I mean, it's meant for kids, but it's it's for everybody. It is. If you like Star Wars. 
you know. Hey, why not, right? <laughs> so, on the show, we have a great author, Tim Wagner. I know him from the World Horror Con, where he's a member of the Horror Writers Association. Right. Uh, he does a lot of books for television series like Supernatural. Mm -hmm. He did a lot of D&D stuff. He did the Kingsman novelization, and he's just an incredible author, and he's coming on the show to talk about what it's like being an author with his success. He's a Bram Stoker Award winner. That's great. Yeah. And he talks about what it's like in a modern market, how he got where he is, how to become a media tie-in author, mm -hmm. and he also shares a great little ghost story with us. That's great. So this is my interview with Tim Wagner on What Are You Afraid of Horror and Paranormal Show, episode 67, The Turkey Day Horror. <laughs> One of the things we do on What Are You Afraid of Horror and Paranormal Show is that we support a lot of indie authors and we've had the grand pleasure of speaking to many indie and professional commercial authors, musicians, and artists on the show as we try to provide support to what is very much a very difficult field. And a lot of us are struggling out there to make a name for ourselves, to find the path that will lead us to success. Often, you know, we know there's a door out there, but we don't know where the door is. And it falls upon sages, scholars, and teachers who have found their way to bring us forward into the next generation of indie artists and authors. Tonight we are speaking with Tim Wagner, and he has had an amazing career. He's published close to 40 novels, three collections of short stories. He writes original dark fantasy and horror, as well as many media tie-ins. His articles on writing have appeared in numerous publications. He's received the Bram Stoker Award for Superior Achievement in Long Fiction, and he's been a finalist for the Shirley Jackson Award and Scrap Award. His fiction has received numerous honorable mentions in volumes of Best Horror of the Year, and he's a full-time tenured professor who teaches creative writing and composition at Sinclair College in Dayton, Ohio. And he's also a Dungeons and Dragons author of Eberron, and that's, that's a big deal to me personally since... I grew up playing D&D, &D and it's very exciting to meet these people that, that wrote a lot of your dreams when you were young. How are you tonight, Tim? Well, I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Oh, thank you for coming on. It's, it's a great treat. And I know we've, we've met a few times at the various horror conventions, and you were kind enough to uh, read Mercy for me and do a blurb on the back of it, mm -hmm. which, which was incredibly yeah. helpful at the time. And thank you so much for doing that. That means a lot to a lot of a lot of the newer authors coming up. At that time, I was getting into novel writing and, and just finding my place. And you're here with us tonight. So, getting into writing and talking about you, how did, how did this begin? Where did your writing start? You know, I'm one of those people that kind of told stories all their life without even realizing that's what they were doing. You know, I would, like, range... You know, almost like little plays that my friends and I would do when we were young, um, read a ton. And um, as time went on, uh, I started getting into comics. And then I thought this was cool because I wanted to be an artist at the time. So uh, along about sixth grade, I started drawing my own little comic book. And I wrote it just so I had something to draw. And all my friends would talk about how terrible the pictures were, but <laughs> how much they loved the stories. And it made me mad because I really wanted to be a comic artist. And then, I think I was about 16, I was reading a, uh, an old Tomb of Dracula magazine. It was uh, Marvel Comics, but it was the, a black and white magazine. You know, the stuff was a little more adult than what you might find on the newsstand. And it would have some articles in the back. And they had an uh, interview with Stephen King. And it was right after, I think, The Shining had come out. So he was still a pretty new author. And uh, what, when I read it, and like an epiphany hit me that being a writer was something a person could choose to do. Because it never occurred to me before. And, you know, I, I went to my mom and I said, you know, I, I think I might like to be a writer. And she was very sweet and she didn't like, you know, make fun of me or say you'll never eat again or anything like that. You know, she said, I think you'd be a good one. And from that part point on, I just started, you know, shifting over more and more to uh, writing more than drawing. And then by the time I hit college, when I was 18, you know, I started working on my first novel, which was one of a number that were never published, but that's when I first started getting serious about it. So in your experience writing novels, did you find that 
you had to write a few to learn how to write novels? Oh, yeah, I think I may have written maybe 10 before my first one was published. And a couple of the a couple of those early ones have been published since then, but I'd say probably I've got five to seven that will never see the light of day ever. They're terrible. Right. Of course. Well, that's that's kind of par for the course. <laughs> exactly. I think as authors, we see 50% of our work published, and then we have a fallow file sitting on the computer just, you know, that'll never see the light of day. That's that's probably a good percentage, actually. You know, it, 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 the old-timers had talked about how the first million words were practice, and that really helped a lot because I it made me realize that the more I wrote, the, you know, the closer I was getting to my goal, and it didn't make me feel like I had to publish everything or everything had to be perfect right away. So that 50% percentage, that's a good one. I need to tell my students that because it's it, it kind of gives you a tangible way to think about, you know, your progress. Right, that's, and that's, it's very important to have a sort of path planned out and to have reasonable expectations so that you don't, become too disappointed and too disillusioned. That's that's a question for you is, were there ever moments in this long path of yours where you were so disheartened and so disappointed that you threw up your hands and said, I'm never doing this again? <laughs> I don't know how many times there have been like that. Um, I think it's really common to feel that way overall. Um, the, the Probably the worst one, though, was um, I had written... A novel it's called the harmony society and it's since come out from uh, right now it's out from dark regions and you can find it but this was probably 20 years ago or so and the game company white wolf was doing a series of original novels uh, along with their game novels and they bought the harmony society from me and it was my you know first novel sale and it was the first novel i had done that was like mine it was my kind of horror my kind of weird fantasy dark fantasy stuff and uh, so i was very excited it was like very affirming that you know that my original stuff my vision and my voice all that you know was marketable it was going to get out there and then for whatever reasons the editor suddenly just pulled the pulled the contract and said we're no longer comfortable with the book and it was just devastating and uh i was really down and then uh, uh i was talking with gary bronbeck uh, the fabulous writer if people out there haven't read his stuff you should because he's amazing and he said you are so lucky and i said what the hell are you talking about and he said this happened to you with your first book so now you can get over this and learn how to deal with it it didn't happen to you on your third or your fourth or your fifth where it might have been a lot harder uh to take and uh you know that might have been a like kind of cold comfort but i really do think that the, the gary was right because if you can get past something like that and keep on going uh you know it's not necessarily a lot easier to take the hits as they come but you know you can survive them and you know you have strategies to get around them yeah, it's funny you talk about that and it's some one of the advice that i give to a lot of other authors you know as we're sort of helping each other through boot camp is that they'll, they'll tell me they're rejected and i would say good do it some more because this is what's going to strengthen you this is what's going to harden you and you know get this over with now because the more successful you become, it's funny because when I first started writing, I was getting rejected all the time naturally, and I took it in stride. And then I started selling like crazy, and now every rejection is devastating. You know? <laughs> yes, it still is for me too. And, and I kind of miss those days when I didn't care. I was just doing what I loved. And there's definitely a transition between being a recreational author and a professional author. That's true. And the very first rejection I got was, uh, I think I was 18 or 19. It was from Asimov's magazine. I didn't even know at the time because there was no internet to check this kind of stuff um, back then. So I didn't even know you were supposed to send a self-addressed stamp envelope. So what I got, and there was no email or anything to, to, to send it. So what I got back was just a postcard that said your story has been rejected. If you want it, you know, send us an envelope. And I was too embarrassed to send it in. But I was so excited because I'd actually made... The contact, you know, it had gone full circle. I'd written something, I'd sent it out, someone had read it, and they had responded. And uh, so I kept that little card, I framed it and kept it on the wall for a long time. And uh, it's not framed anymore, but I still have it. But, you know, I still try to remember if if the rejections come that, you know, I've still made that cycle. You know, and I because you write to be read, you write to get your work out there in the world. And that if somebody says no to you, that means that you're going to get that much closer to yes, because... 
the yes is somewhere you know down the line so you're you know that one step closer to that right and and that's you know those those simpler days and i find that there's always another level to reach you're never if you're comfortable you know that's that's great and all but there's always the next step to take it to and and of course the dream of financial stability which is becoming harder and harder something jasper talked about was that you know every author now has to sort of do their own marketing anymore Mm -hmm. and unless because even with you always dream of getting into like a new york publisher and then you figure they'll assign you a marketing team and it's just not true anymore because they push their money to what he called their tentpole authors and leave their auxiliary authors to fend for themselves right yeah i think it's been going on for a long time really because it's I, I don't think I've ever had anybody show me a marketing plan. I mean, occasionally they ask me to fill out these giant marketing kind of questionnaires, and I have no clue if any of it's used, really. You do a lot of, of your own work, but you also do media tie-ins. Like, I, mm-hmm. I know you've done the books for Supernatural. You've done a Stargate novel. Now, would you say your media tie-ins supported your, your own personal writing, or was it vice versa Did your own stories help promote the media tie-in career you know the the common wisdom that you hear from people who do both like their own original work and tie-in work is that there's no real like cross-pollination between the two you know the the people who are fans of supernatural are supernatural fans they're not fans of you and uh, they won't migrate over to your other work and if they do they're often disappointed (laughs) i saw a review on amazon from somebody who had read one of my supernatural books then picked up one of my horror novels which is you know this one was particularly one was particular one was very surreal and very extreme. <laughs> it was not exactly what this gentleman was expecting. So, you know, in some ways, uh, it's one of the reasons why people often use pseudonyms in the first place. You know, just so that people understand that this name goes with mystery, this name goes with western, and it's so they know what they're getting. Uh, you know, whenever they pick up a novel. But in, in my case, no, I don't. I don't really think that there is seems to be an overlap. Too much the uh, the media tie-in stuff in general, you know, t- especially if you if you factor in your original stuff coming out in small press sometimes too, uh, it pays more. Yeah, uh, usually, um, not a ton more by any means. So you're not going to get you're not going to get rich off of it. Did, were you a Supernatural fan before you started writing Supernatural? Yeah, yeah, I started watching it when it first came out, and I got to watch the transformation of it, at least in the, in the public eye. From here's a supernatural show about you know a couple guys killing monsters to here's a couple hunky guys <laughs> who are out killing monsters that a lot of people find attractive. So uh, yeah, so I ended up being a fan of the show uh, before it became kind of the the, the gigantic phenomena, you know that that it's become. Um, for me, whenever I like uh, you know work on a time project, uh, when I was a, an undergrad, I started off as a, an acting major before I shifted over into teaching and writing. And I think of media tie-ins as like acting. It's like it, it would be my version of, you know, doing Hamlet or my version of, you know, uh, as an actor, but also kind of as a director too. But it's my job to interpret whatever the, the original work is. And, of course, it's a little different because I'm not just saying other people's words. I have to – it's almost like taking a script and then improvising from the script. Um, but I, I think of it that way, and it really helps a lot. So it's it's still like, like if you imagine like all the different types of performances you could have of Hamlet, you know the words are the same, but each individual person could put their stamp on them, and so I think it's similar when you do media tie-in stuff. I mean, it, there are lots of supernatural books, and if you by different authors, and if you read them, yeah, it's going to be Sam and Dean, and hopefully everybody's done a good job trying to capture their world and their voices and their relationship, but it's still going to have the individual stamp of each author on it too. So how did that come about? I mean, did they contact you? Do you have an agent contact them? How did you begin writing Supernatural in the Everdon books? And well, yeah, it's it's really a, an odd thing because one of the things you need to do to write media time stuff usually is already approved that you can write your and publish your own stuff, and so that they know that you can create fiction, you can create a short story, novel, whatever it is that you've done so successfully, you can do so on time. Um, that in general, you know, it turns out pretty good. So you need a little bit of a track record usually to do this. Um, I just started bugging people because I thought it would be interested to do, interesting to do. Um, Mike Stackpole took me around years ago at an Origins convention, gaming convention, 
in Columbus, Ohio, and introduced me to some game people, you know, who might be interested in doing novels. And that never panned out, but I just kept doing that myself. I would go to, to Gen Con and introduce myself or, you know, email, like if they're having an open call for novelists, I would email. And I had done that with Dungeons and Dragons, and I hadn't heard anything from them. And so I read this book called The Renegade Writer, uh, Linda Formicelli, and I forget who else wrote it with her. Um, but this was a book, it was about uh, nonfiction freelance writing. But the concept of it was that here's the basic stuff that everybody tells you about how to get published. And now here's the real stuff that people do, like the stuff that one level up, you know, ways that you can interact with editors, network, whatever, that they don't tell you, you know, like in Publishing 101. But I read this and I'm like, huh, they always tell you never to call, but it says here to call. So I called up the you know, the people at Wizards of the Coast, and I had told, you know, introduced myself, and I told them, you know, that I've been, uh, you know, I'd sent some stuff in, you know, I haven't heard anything, and uh, they said, oh, we're so sorry, let's we'll get, hook you up with an editor here, and so <laughs> next thing I know, I'm talking to an editor, and he's apologizing because it takes so long to get some stuff, and then he's like, you know, we've been thinking about doing this young adult uh, series for Dragonlance, and we've had nobody to, to develop it. Do you want to do that? And I'm like, yes, yes, I would very much like to do that. And so it just, and then suddenly I was doing it and, you know, I developed the basic series and I did two books in it and I think it ran for like at least 12 books and they had some, uh, offshoot books too. And then that led to me doing Eberron and cause once you get in at a place, then they start to say, Oh, would you like to do this? Or would you like to do that? Um, in the case of supernatural, I, once I found out who the editor is, uh, the supernatural books, at least at the time. And, she said, well, you know, we don't have any openings right now, but we'll keep you in mind. And then somebody dropped out of a project, and suddenly they asked if I could do it. Um, the second Supernatural book I did was a choose-your-own-adventure type book for a different publisher, but it was the same deal. Um, some, some Two writers that were working on that dropped out. Um, I may get to do another tie, and I can't say anything about it yet, just because it may not come to pass. But it was just in the last couple of days that I was contacted, and it's the same deal. Uh, another writer dropped out, so... Um, once you get started and people know that you do this stuff and you start making connections, you know, it becomes easier. Uh, people will ask you to do them. And, of course, you can always bug people, too. If you hear that, oh, this thing's going on and this sounds cool, I can go ahead and introduce myself. Um, but you have to have a bit of a track record before you can start doing that. Although short stories is a great way. You wouldn't have to have a ton of, you know, you could have a track record of just a few short stories if you find out there's some kind of tie-in anthology that's going on. And that could be a good way to build your credentials when you approach a like a book editor for tie-ins. You know, I've had these short stories published, even if it's just you know one, two, or three, published about like Stargate or whatever, and that just shows that you can work with a media tie-in property and handle it really well. So it'd be a really good calling card. A lot of times, it's very daunting to contact these companies because they say you must have an agent to contact us. How do you feel about that? Well, you know, like I said in the, the Renegade Writer, the whole premise of that book was, you know, here's the stuff that they tell you and don't do it. But if you t if you follow that approach, you know, it's kind of at your own peril. Um, you really don't know if it's going to work or not. Uh, if they say that you need an agent, you know, in general, that's a, a big part of that is just a way to cut down on their reading. Um, you know, back when I was being published by Leisure Books, I got to visit uh, the you know their company or their offices or whatever uh, during a world horror convention in New York and there were manuscripts everywhere uh, piled everywhere and at this point you know there's probably more of that sitting on some you know on somebody's hard drive or whatever but it's the same thing they've got so much work to get through um, and the stereotype is that you know if you work in New York people are reading on the train as they commute in and out of the city uh, they're constantly reading uh, my agent's constantly reading stuff all the time. And that's, you know, what she'll do in, at night after she's done everything else during the day. So I think that in terms of, of, of having an agent be kind of like a first reader, that at least when it, it comes in to a publisher from an agent, you know, they know somebody's looked at it, somebody's vetted it, somebody says, you know, this is a professional quality. So I think having an agent to do that kind of work for you can really help. But I know lots of writers who, who don't have agents and do it all on their own and that are, you know, are published from small press to medium press to major press. So yeah, I guess it really depends on whether or not you feel like you would be the most, um, like the strongest advocate for your work, you know, the, the most aggressive in a good way, you know, uh, advocate for your work. And if you don't feel like you can do that, 
And most writers, I think, are, are more introverted, or at least we'd rather write than, than do that kind of stuff. Then probably an agent is good for you. But, I mean, do you absolutely have to have one to, to get a novel deal? No. Do you need to have one to approach, like, a particular publisher that says, we will not look at unagented manuscripts? Maybe, because you might not be able to find a way around that. Night Eyes, written by Tim Wagoner, based on one of the author's weird true-life experiences, read by David Walton. In the darkness at the foot of Jerome's bed, two glowing eyes hovered. Yellow eyes, hungry eyes, eyes that swayed hypnotically back and forth as they inched slowly forward. Jerome pressed back against the headboard, as if he might somehow push himself through it and the wall behind, push himself to safety. But the headboard and the wall held, no escape that way. And then the sound began, a circadia-like drone, but deeper and slower, as if someone had recorded the noise made by the summer insects, and then played the tape back at a far slower speed. Or perhaps it was more like the staccato vibration of a rattle, thick and heavy, growing forth from the scaly smooth tip of a snake's tail. The eyes swayed as if they might belong to a huge serpent, but they were a solid, sour amber, nothing at all like snake eyes. The eyes, and presumably the unseen head to which they were attached, continued swaying forward. Jerome clutched the sweat-sodden bedsheet to his chest, fingers digging into the damp fabric. His pulse beat a trip-hammer counterpoint to the creature's drum, but his lungs had seized up in his chest and refused to work. He wanted nothing more than to fling the sheet at the eyes, to snuff out their baleful glow, and then spring off the bed and make a dash for the light switch. Instinct told him that whatever this apparition was, it couldn't stand the light, and if his instinct was false, then at least he would be able to see the thing. Seeing would make the creature solid, would define it, force it to be real, and what was real could be dealt with. But this, glowing orbs and nerve-jangling drone, how could this be fought? But no matter how hard Jerome willed his limbs to work, they refused to obey him. He could only lie there, body rigid and pouring sweat, as the eyes came ever nearer. As a child, he had once looked at a book about snakes. He recalled one picture of a sparrow standing helplessly in the grass, frozen by the mesmeric gaze of a snake as it approached to devour the tiny bird. The picture had been meant to illustrate one of the many myths about snakes, but Jerome knew it was no mere fable, for he was the sparrow now. The eyes reached his feet, then swayed and bobbed past ankles, calves. What was this thing? Why was it here? He had never been especially afraid of snakes, had never harmed Henny, had never seen any close-up outside of the reptile house at the zoo, for God's sakes. There was no reason for this thing to be here. Past his knees, thigh, crotch, sliding through the air above his belly. No reason. And that frightened him infinitely more than the eyes set into the darkness, more than the rattling drone that filled the air, that this might very well be happening for no reason whatsoever. Then the logical part of his mind broke free of the fear and spoke up. This couldn't possibly be real. From the position of the eyes, if there were a snake, he should be able to feel its coils upon his legs and stomach. But he felt nothing. Therefore, it was just a dream, or at worst a hallucination, all in his head. How could it be anything else? Moving across his chest, closing in on his face, 
the drone rising in pitch and volume, nearly deafening now. Still, Jerome felt no weight on his body, sensed no movement of the air caused by the swaying of a large serpent head. The eyes drew nearer, their glow completely filling his vision. And then they were gone. The light extinguished. The rattle drone ended. The room fell silent. Jerome lay there for a long moment before finally drawing in a relieved breath. Just a dream, he thought gratefully. A dream that was now over. His throat was bone dry and he had to go to the bathroom something fierce. He got out of bed, his limbs no longer frozen now that the dream was over, and padded across the floor, wearing only a sweaty pair of pyjama bottoms. In the bathroom, he turned on the tap and then looked into the mirror. He saw a pair of glowing yellow eyes staring back at him, heard the rattling erupt in his skull, and then he realised with a cold stab of horror that he had been right. It was all in his head. Hi, I'm David Walton, and I drop whatever I'm doing to read whatever Fox and Phil demand of me. My digital, as opposed to ectoplasmic alter ego, is called Brendan Shawland, who regularly plays guitar and sings in a virtual world. Brendan has a website, David doesn't. Bandcamp sales figures would suggest that Brendan's music is decidedly niche. If you want to be in the vanguard of support as Brendan heads towards global domination, just put Brendan Shawland in your favourite search engine and you'll find his website very close to the top. You'll see what the human looks like and you can check out the Listen to a Song page to access Brendan's unwillingly private world of creative output. So that was a, um, a, a frightening little story there, wonderfully narrated by David Walton. He's great. He does a lot of our, our ghost stories for us. And you said that it was actually based on one of your weird true life experiences. You want to tell us a little about that? Yeah, well, actually, the experience is exactly the story, except for the, the last few lines, which I added. It, uh, I'd never had anything before or since like this. I don't know if it was a waking dream or hallucination, but everything in the story, uh, I heard this um, kind of weird sound like a rattlesnake uh, rattle, and I saw these two glowing orbs that were at the foot of my bed that seemed like eyes, and they swayed back and forth as they just kept coming closer and closer to me. And I was, and that rattlesnake sound was continued going on, and I was absolutely paralyzed. I could not move. I was terrified. I had a, a lamp on my headboard, and a um, little reading lamp, and I could reach up and turn it on, but I couldn't move. And as it came closer and closer, it seemed to be moving. I couldn't feel it, but the eyes were moving, like, past where my legs were and kind of up to where my stomach was. I finally was able to move and reach up and turn on the light, and it was gone. It wasn't there. Um, but it felt, everything felt real. I mean, I can still remember you know, my heart pounding. I can still remember the feeling of trying to get my muscles to move, tell them to move, and they just refused to do it. And uh, if it was a dream, it was the most vivid, realistic one I have ever had in my life. Your source for everything paranormal, para S. Caliber and Press LLC is a Madison, Wisconsin-based publishing company owned and operated by Alan Ledden. Caliber and works with talented writers, artists, editors, and marketers throughout the United States, and you can find their books through their many imprints that include Damnation Books, Eternal Press, Malafuria Press, Ciento Sordida Publishing, and Spiro Publishing. 
please visit their website at sites.google.com forward slash site forward slash Caliburn Press LLC forward slash home or Google Caliburn Press to check out their growing list of titles on Amazon.com, BarnesandNoble.com, and any other place fine books are sold. From the author of the Ghost of Hollywood series and Workplace Spells comes a book for all lovers of pets, Animal Spells and Magic by Marla Brooks. Learn how to choose your next pet according to their astrological sign. Explore animal superstitions. Learn 25 magic spells for your pets and get instructions on creating your own spells. Learn who to call upon and what to use to cast these spells. Include special chapters by Reverend Tim Shaw, Psychic to the Stars Kenny Kingston, Psychic Medium Victoria Gross, Animal Communicator Dinah Roseberry, and Shaman Willie Windwalker Gibson. This is the perfect book for all animal lovers. Animal Spells and Magic by Marla Brooks. For details on how to get your copy of this amazing new book, go to www.shifferbooks.com or check out Marla Brooks online at www.marlabrooks.com. This would make the perfect gift for the animal lover in your life. Go to www.shifferbooks.com or ask about it at your local bookstore. Great interview with Tim. That was great. we got part two coming up where he talks about where nightmares come from. And this is a book where Crystal Lake Publishing went back and talked to a lot of the great horror authors currently writing Mm -hmm. to find out what their secrets are for writing horror fiction. You know, you've got people like Clive Barker, Joe R. Lansdale, John Connolly, Lisa Morton, who's president of the Harvard Association, Richard Geismere, Joe Meinhardt, who's the editor, and he's the editor at Crystal Lake, and of course, Tim Wagner. And this is basically the book of the best horror authors currently writing, telling you how to write horror. Mm -hmm. And you can find that at crystallakepub.com, or at Amazon, where nightmares come from, the art of storytelling in the horror genre. And we'll have links for that up at the website at www.whatareyouafraidofpodcast.com. And Tim Tim has helped me a lot, hmm. too. Yeah, so. that was some great advice that he gave. Yeah. That, that book kind of reminds me of something uh, it's called Paperbacks from Hell. Have, okay. you ever, have you ever heard of that? I have not. You ever heard of that? Mm-hmm. It's, um, it's by uh, an author. I can't remember his name, but he did a couple other things. Okay. He did um, Horror Store, mm-hmm. uh, which is kind of like a, a twist uh, on Ikea, sort okay. of, like a, a haunted Ikea, sort mm-hmm. of, I think. And he did, um, I think it was called uh, My Best Friend's Exorcism mm-hmm. or something like that. Um, no, don't quote me on that because it could be wrong. But, I'll check <laughs> you know, but I'm actually 99% right that those titles are correct. But um, I might check and edit all that out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm pretty sure they're right, though. But, okay. Um, but anyway, yeah. Uh, I'm looking forward to some some upcoming things. Yeah. You know? Okay. That was Grady Hendrix. Grady Hendrix. Yeah. Right. He did Horror oh, yeah. Store. You know. Paperbacks from Hell. So, what are you looking forward to watching this Thanksgiving? I mean, is there anything special, fun coming up that you like? Um, yeah. Uh, well, I'm always looking forward to you know the Charlie Brown. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. Specials. The Thanksgiving yeah, okay. Charlie Brown right. specials. They're great. You know, and of course, you know, planes, trains, and automobiles. <gasps> you took it. I, I'm. Yeah, I looked for it today for video, on video. Couldn't find it. I think I have the DVD. If not, it's on Amazon to render by. Isn't it on Netflix? It, no, it's not. Oh, it's not. They took it off because uh, it, it cycled out. It's not on Hulu either. It might be on Amazon. Actually, wow. it's not on Amazon. You got to rent it because Stars has it Jeez. right now. So Stars grabbed it. I know we were looking last night. My wife's not a big movie fan, but she loves it. John Candy, mm-hmm. the late great John Candy. You guys do watch it. Oh yeah, oh. every year. Steve yeah. Martin. You know, the great Del Griff is played by John Candy, and Steve Martin's that uptight guy just trying to get home to his family. <laughs> and then at the end, of course, you find out that John Candy doesn't have a family. Yeah, And I that know. he's homeless, and yep. he's traveling from... It's a, it's, a, it's a great little twist at the end that you don't really see coming. Yeah, to, to make you feel thankful. But that leaves one movie okay. that, is, that tops them all. Mm-hmm. Thanks Killing. Thanks Killing. Thanks Killing. Right. It can't be Thanksgiving watch without watching Thanksgiving. the atrocity that is Thanksgiving. <laughs> is it that bad? <laughs> no, it's not that bad. Right. Okay. No. It, it's, it's, it's supposed to be bad. Mm-hmm. It's, it's a, a horror comedy with a right. ridiculous turkey that comes back to life after hundreds of years you know, to, like uh, to wreak havoc. Pilgrim curse. It's a pilgrim curse, That's and he comes back kind. to life. It's kind of the same thing we were talking 
we were talking yeah. about the same themes where you know the zombies come the, the, uh, the turkeys zombie come turkey. back in zombie form and attack people and in California and this but this turkey talks though mm-hmm. you know he um <laughs> he likes cursing a lot he's got a really foul mouth he's, got a, re- he's a foul mouth <laughs> he's got a foul mouth turkey no pun intended he's got hell, a foul mouth got a no, foul mouth no pun intended yeah, yeah. a little bit. <laughs> Tiny yeah, bit, yeah, he's the turkey from hell. That's right. <laughs> and some mean, of the stuff he turkey. says is really—I can't repeat it right no, now. But fine. some of the stuff is really funny, you yeah. know. And uh, this is some, you know, some blood and guts. And there's also a sequel. Uh, oh, of course there is. And it's called Thanks Killing Three. Oh, because they skipped two. They skipped two. Oh. They said it was something about it was so crazy that they didn't need to do a second one, or there mm-hmm. was a second one made. And then someone stole the copy of the second one, oh, so it went right into it went into three. Oh god! It was a really, really I don't know. I've never, I've never seen anyone do something like that before, but mm-hmm. it, it was. It's really weird. And I I actually haven't, for the record, ever made it all the way through. Thanks, Killing Three. It's always okay. I've always turned it off halfway through because I couldn't take it. <laughs> but um, it's part of the charm. It's part of the charm. It is part of the charm. Yeah. yeah. No, I actually, and believe it or not, like I'm not. I'm kind of joking around about the movies or whatever, mm-hmm. but I do, I do watch them every year, though. Yeah, I love I watch them every like single it. year. We and do the West Wing. And anyone that wants to watch them, they're on Amazon Prime. Yeah. Okay, Thanks Killings. Thanks Killings on Amazon Killings Prime. Thanks Killings on Amazon Prime. Okay. Both of them, yeah. Oh, one well, and three. Yeah. One and three. <laughs> Two is not. <laughs> Two is not because it doesn't exist, but yes, one and three is. <laughs> yeah. there's, a, there's, a, there's a couple episodes of things we like, like yeah. uh, West Wing. Uh-huh, we okay. Thanksgiving West Wing. That's kind of where I got the idea for the Butterball Hotline. Uh-huh. Watching it last night, my wife, loved, my wife loves that. And, you know, so I guess we'll be doing that, and I'll be cooking tomorrow. Oh, nice. Yeah, and then hopefully writing this weekend. Oh, very cool. Very yeah. cool. Uh, and we're going to be uh, writing a couple things. A couple things. Kind of working on an article. <laughs> I want to get some work done on my new book. Nice. And I just finished a short story about two grave robbers. Yeah. That's you're, funny you're, about that. We were gotta, talking about gotta, that. Gotta that, that, sounds, that, that sounds really cool. Yeah, that sounds a lot of fun. It was just a, it's kind of a warm-up. Yeah, I like, I like and it. And I'm in the process of making a pretty big deal with a commercial publisher. Nice. Yes, that's nice. going. Like I said, oh, oh God, I, I'm vague podcasting, <laughs> but it's going yeah, really it's well, <laughs> and they want to see my next cycle of work, and they nice. want to bring me in to write for one of their major series. And nice, nice. That's yeah, great. Um, that's it's going to provide a lot of financial stability. Nice, that's great. While, while writing something, it's going to be fun to do. Yeah, that's great. That's kind of what we're working towards. Yeah, yeah you got it, man. That's awesome. Well, it's been a great show. It, oh, this has been a, a wonderful show. Yeah, and um, it's been a lot of fun. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. Well, you no. you have a very happy Thanksgiving 2017. You too, and and can you believe this is our third Thanksgiving? I know our third Thanksgiving podcast. Yeah, you Special. would have thought we would have moved on to great careers by now and forgotten all this nonsense. <laughs> hey, we like it. It's fun. Yeah, right? <laughs> forget about all this. Yeah, this Penhurst was stuff. certainly fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? Oh yeah, Penhurst was certainly fun. Right? Oh yeah, it was, yeah, it was tough, but it was it was a bit tough. Yeah. We yeah. did it. But hopefully, hopefully we'll Walking see. around in 90 degree weather at, in October. Yeah, <laughs> wearing makeup and a suit jacket. And yep. I just finally wiped the last bit of white makeup off my vest today. <laughs> it took that long, it right? It took that long to get it off. I'll never do anything so stupid again. <laughs> so, anyway, check out check out, the, okay. check out the website at www.whatareyouafraidofpodcast.com for new ghost stories, updated information on each episode, information about our guests, and links to all their crap. Right. All their stuff. All their, all their stuff. crap. All, all their, their stuff, yeah. All their crappy crap. Well, Phil, it's been episode 67, a turkey day horror. The turkey day horror. The turkey day horror. Yeah, we had some fun stuff. Thanks thanks to a lot of the people who helped out in the show, whoever they were. I hope you have a great holiday. Gobble, gobble. Gobble, gobble. Oh, love turkey day. It's a day to celebrate. Turkey time, paradigm, turkey time, paradigm, the weather is cold.
Music for this episode, Turkey Time, by Monk Turner. Turkey Bones, by Tunstart Bass Bound. Key Fox Dunham lives in Philadelphia with his wife Allison. He's a lymphoma survivor, cancer patient, modern bard and historian. His first book, The Street Martyr, was published by Gutter Book, a major motion picture based on the book is being produced by Throughline Films. Destroying the tangible illusion of reality or searching for Andy Kaufman, a book about what it's like to be dying of cancer, was recently released from Perpetual Motion Machine Publishing, and Fox has a story in the Stargate anthology, Points of Origin, from MGM and Fandemonium Books. Mercy was recently released by Bloodbound Books. Fox is an active member of the Harvard Association, he's been published in hundreds of short stories and articles, and his motto is Wrecking Civilization, One Story at a Time. Phil Thomas resides in the suburbs of Philadelphia and is an author and filmmaker. His screenplays have been produced into feature films such as False Face and Always From Darkness that are available in major retailers such as Best Buy and Target, as well as availability on Netflix and Amazon On Demand. The views expressed and the opinions given by the individual host and their guests do not necessarily reflect those of Para-X, its affiliates, or its sponsors.